looked down, I could see the yellow flame sort of breach. And they actually received fourth degree burns. So what that means is there was exposed bone. Open canopy door, clamber out onto wing low level and go for it. And as I looked out my left hand canopy window, I saw a thin streak of visible yellow orange flame. And, and I was down and out for the count. Yeah, I start getting a little bit bored in the pool. And I start, you know, bored of counting laps, literally. What um, about um, when I did my quadruple Ironman, I had the, the underwater headphones and I hopped in the pool all ready to listen to David Goggin's audio book. Yeah. And like all great plans, after about, I think, 30 seconds, it just stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> no plan survives contact with the enemy, huh? <laughs> well, I, I'd, um, I bought one of those little waterproof phone bags that you can get to take to the beach or whatever, and I put my phone in, slipped it down the front of my wetsuit, had Goggins play in. He's all good on the Bluetooth. But... Um, I'd recommend that to anyone. If you're doing distance in a pool, which can get a bit, you know, staring down at blue. A bit repetitive, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's I'm, a, I'm a bit of a cheat like that when I do sort of distance. Well, when I do, when I, I run have tried it, actually. I, I did think I did a bit of coaching with the swimming a couple of years back. And, um, and I was, as in, I was being coached by these lovely ladies. It was a course that I was offered through Help for Heroes just to sort of brush up on technique. These girls were fantastic. I mean, I marveled at it because they were all um, sort of middle-aged um, and one or two of them had been involved in like, um, you know, Olympic uh, sort of para-athletes in swimming, that is. And they were really, really amazing. So they just broke me down and then sort of rebuilt me, you know, going back to the drawing board and really focusing on technique and all the little bits that go with that. And you've got to embrace the process, but... What was really fascinating about it was, um, you know, the experience they had, and you've got to you've got to trust trust it or trust them as coaches, and um, yeah, and then at the end of it, um, they one of them lent me, you know, one of these um, underwater, you know, in the ears, and I thought it was just incredible, you know. I mean, I'd never experienced that before, and it felt like a, a real novelty listening to clear music whilst I'm sort of face down in the water, putting the strokes in, you know, to swim. But I mean, it's quite a common thing now for athletes. Like you say, they're, they get, they're getting into this as a, as a form of motivation, you know. Mate, you're not, you're not boring me or anything. I'm just going <laughs> to listen to some Joe Rogan. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. But it's, I think it's like that. Is that what, oh, that's these new things, is it? Yeah, over the over the year, these were yeah, these were similar little things that you know, uh, they, they those ones look pretty pretty uh, you know bulky, if I may say. You know, they're going to give you a bit of drag, aren't they? If you're going for performance. Oh, mate, I'm I'm <laughs> so sylph-like through the pool. I'm like a seal in a pool. <laughs> I need something to slow me down and remind me that I'm o I'm only human. Oh, there you go, mate. Yeah, you know, so some. Uh, industrial sized earplugs do you want to know the problem lay you down the problem jamie is i still haven't get got my head around the fact i need bloody glasses and so i don't ever go out the house with glasses i sunglasses maybe but not real glasses so when i get to the pool i'm like what the what does that say there is that is that how do i sync the bluetooth again it take, <laughs> takes about 20 is that one minutes. the left ear or the right ear i can't tell <laughs> Yeah. But um God, you're are you do you get fed up with people saying your story is just beyond or is is it I mean listen, you know, as a speaker, it's something I've done for probably about eight years of my life now, uh, for various different audiences, you know, everything from schools to you know, um 
give me a pat on the back for this one. Women's Institute, that was quite scary, but a great bunch. And then sort of larger corporates, you know, to, you know, I've, I've spoken to big pharmaceutical company to, uh, you know, British Aerospace Engineering at a, uh, AGM conference and, and big audiences like so. So, you know, you kind of accept that there is an element of uh, one for the speaker with individual story. There's an element of repetitiveness. You feel somewhat like you're kind of regurgitating aspects of your own personal life story, your own history. And so, to yeah, of course, to a degree, you know, if you're reasonably good at what you do, you know, otherwise you probably wouldn't want to go on. But um, you do get you do get encouragement, and and a lot of people yeah turn around and say, of course, you know, wow, you know, it's uh, quite an extraordinary story. So for sure, if I'd had a, a pound every time someone had sort of subtly encouraged me um, with regard to the speaking, then I'd probably be doing pretty well. Mm. But um, it's one of those things, you know, you just accept it, and I think if it helps people. In cliche as it sounds, but if it if the story, you know, you know aspects of my life do um, inadvertently help folk that are listening, then then it's it's a good thing, you know. It can perhaps help to motivate them and give them a bit of a boost in their own mindsets to go on and perhaps uh, you know you know achieve things in life and you know try to to give themselves a bit of a lift. And, and that's what I think. That's what speakers in general or speaking. Is, is kind of what it's all about. And then just a quick one, but you think about it, the earliest, earliest form of entertainment for mankind, you know, I'm talking about, you know, probably caveman sat around the old, you know, the, the campfire. I mean, they didn't have broadband, they didn't have TV or radio broadcasts in those days. So from the, you know, from the earliest origins of man, we probably sat around the campfire out in the open if the weather was good or in the cave system or whatever. I'm just trying to imagine, picture the scene. And what did people do for entertainment? Well, they danced around the fire, for sure, but you know, there's only so much energy you can expend and you're, gonna, you're soon going to grow tired of that. Um, so you know, there was probably a lot of stories were being told you know, from the elders getting passed around the, the group you know, and, and that's how lessons were learned. And, and it, so stories, that's what I'm trying to say, with mankind are literally the very earliest forms of um, entertainment, as it were. And I think it's important that, you know, we, we don't lose sight of that. You know, for all of the, the noise on this planet in terms of media, in terms of everything that's in our faces – every single day and you know where I'm coming from because you've got you turn on the TV you're inundated with advertisements you know television radio internet and you've got so much information coming at you 24 7 but I think it's um, it's kind of crucially important that you know as human beings that we don't lose sight of you know that that ability to be able to just talk to one another and for for people to subsequently, you know, embrace that and listen. And, and we don't lose the, the essence of good old fashioned communication. And to some degree, that is probably lost a little bit in this day and age. I mean, I just came back on a train from the pool this morning, just a few stops in, in London uh, to get back to, to where I'm based. And, you know, I, no, I couldn't help but notice, and you see it time and time again, everybody sort of head down, on their phones, nobody's kind of making eye contact, nobody's really talking to each other anymore. It's a kind of a changing world and a changing scene. So perhaps ever more reason why, you know, good old fashioned human interaction and stories and perhaps speakers are quite, you know, useful in life. But it's just mm -hmm. my, my take on it, just my observation. And what about How much of your story do you tell? Because I'm sure you, you've got your story. I've got mine. I'm saying that so people at home don't go, oh, Chris, yours is nothing like it. It's like when I'm not trying to say that. What, what I'm trying to say is we both speak about what were incredibly difficult 
challenging times in our lives. And I'm starting to wonder if maybe I shouldn't go so full ball because I don't think I, 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 I'm not sure if people so, some kind of get it. I don't think others are kind of ready to hear it. That, like the depths of addiction is not very pleasant, you know. Sure, but I think, you know, never underestimate yourself. And I think that for individuals in general, if you feel like you've got a story to tell and if you feel, you know, from the heart that it, it's worth telling and you could thereby help other people, you know, by sharing that, um, then I think it's a good thing and it, and it can be not only good for the individual, but it can be good for, for audiences. And you've only have to have that, that will and that inclination to want to tell your story and to want to share it with others. And I would say to anybody that feels that they've got a story, you know, don't be afraid. Like I said, it goes back to that good old fashioned, you know, the merits of human communication, mm. you know, that's age old skills. And in a way we're partly losing that. Uh, because of the modern age and technology and the internet and so on. And so these, these is, this is an important issue in a way. It's, it's kind of an important topic or, or a debate. It's worth speaking out and it's worth sharing. And I would encourage anybody, especially young people, who perhaps are so wrapped up in technology and you know they've been brought up with that now in the 21st century, uh, and, you, you know, when we were kids, you know, mm. back in the day, we were kind of out in the park and, you know, climbing the trees or riding our BMX bikes around the park and kicking a football around. I'm not saying that doesn't go on, but there's perhaps less of that with the ju- younger generation now because they're so glued to technology and computer games and the internet and that rapid I'll you, information. I'll tell you what, Jeremy, don't get me started. And I say that because anyone who watches my channel knows I talk about agenda 24 mm. 7 it's i'm a father i it's my duty you know i'm i'm sworn to protect a young person and ah it, it to those of us in the know it's so blatantly apparent what is what is going on and the destruction of society humanity individual identity um we're now it's like you say conversations is so important, but now the conversation comes, it starts off from Walt Disney. Then it, then it comes up through the ranks and it ends up with CNN and Fox news. Um, Perhaps we take that for another, uh, another day because I, I I don't want to, I I talk about it a lot is what I'm trying to say. But I, I completely, I agree with you 100%. You know, we, we're in a situation now where when I go for my run and I run down, and say, I run down the cycle path and there's all these lycra crad 40-year-olds on their £3,000 mountain bike trying to, I don't know what they're doing. I'm, I applaud it. I think it's good, but... What I'd applaud more if they could hold their head up and say hello when they go past me. That, especially when they've got three children in tow. And I think, you know, if people are wondering what what the effects of this agenda is, what it's doing to us, this is a great example. It means that a father who should be the leader of his household should be an example, should be somebody his children are fiercely proud of. My daddy was this and he was this, right? You know, tra- 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 that traditional, it's now turned into like Rakad Wally, who literally has not got the social skills outside of the office environment to go, all right, mate, you know, that's what it's come down to. Um, it's really kind of a, um, right. I, yeah, I don't no, know I if think, I'm uh, sending out yeah. subtle uh, messages there, but I've had my glasses delivered. Oh, fair um, one. You know, I think that's um, a fair observation there, Chris. I mean, I'm not a father, so I can't really comment um, 
um, you know, as yet. Um, but that is an observation that, uh, you know, fathers or indeed parents should, should be role models and it's not, set the tone. But, I mean, are we losing I, that sense of community spirit? Yes, massively. It's, it's been dis- purposely being destroyed because once, once the community's gone, once that connect, human connection is gone, then the psychopaths have just got free reign to do what the hell they like. But um, uh, we can, you know, we can look upon things, you know, you know, we have to be careful because uh, I think in general, as far as society goes, there'll always be an element of, you know, our society that we need to be wary of. But there is also, you know, there's a lot of good out there. And, you know, there's, there's always going to be perhaps good versus Sort of less good, or I don't like to use the word evil, but you know, um, I mean, you know, long time ago, don't hold it against me, but I was an ex, um, I'm an ex police officer, so I saw a darker side of uh, life and, and what goes on out there, what truly goes on, you know, that often doesn't get reported. And, um, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of victim and there's a, there is a lot of hate, mm. but there's a lot of people out there that, you know, generally speaking you know, sort of upstanding members of society and they, they do try to do good and, and live by morals and principles and values. But I will say that, um, yeah, I, I, I'm inclined to agree with you. I feel that um, we, are, we are losing somewhat. You Can know, I uh, clarify uh, that, Jamie, so I'm not misunderstood? I'm, I'm yeah. not criticising the individual, not, not at yeah. all. I'm talking from a structural, global holistic perspective you can see the damage that has been done to people i'm i'm not i'm just using one guy as an example sure sure you you can take the 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 war on females that's just reigned for god knows how long to uh, this this uh, destructive beauty culture and the mental health crisis it's now landed young young people in and i I only want to offer solutions because I don't believe in scaremong. You know, it's easy. I could have a podcast and just go and da, da, da. And, and a lot of do. And a lot of quite intellectual people have got podcasts where they consistently just point out issues and come up with possibly what I would call superficial responses to it. Um, but I'm. It's a changing world, isn't it? It's, a, it's certainly a changed world since, since we were very young and you, some sometimes for the better, but a, a lot of the change is not necessarily for the better in terms of perhaps the development of of younger persons, especially. And there's bits and pieces I think that we're lacking compared to perhaps uh, you know what uh, what children you know and younger people you know were developing in certain areas. And there's bits and pieces now that that are sort of lacking in terms of that. And maybe it goes back to what I said. You know, maybe that. Uh, communication skills are starting to fall by the wayside a little bit because um, we're just so um, engrossed in, you know, the wrath of information and media. And it's, it's more than ever. It's hardly, it's yeah. like the world is high speed now. There's not a lot of time for, for much else. Um, it's all, we should strike that balance. It's all been steered towards the, what I call left, the, the left brain. So the ego, it's all this, right. I've got a, keypad so I can respond immediately to this injustice and the psychopaths I call quite they just feel they're throwing fuel on that fire because they love the division they love the fact that we're even having to have this conversation here now I'm sure I'm you know sure. it's just it's just uh you know it's not I don't think it's uh it's the be all and end all and we need to just look towards the future and see how we can in a way, make life better and then bring back those real values and principles and whether it's community spirit, we need to focus on more. And there's ways and means that we can kind of claw back, you know, the good traits of, of our own humanity. We just need to work on it, you know, and you'd like to think that the life in general is, is a work in progress. You know, we recognize perhaps uh, where we're slipping a little bit and we can hopefully nurture things and, boost things for the better, mm. make, make society a chirpier place to be and make people kind of happier, reduce, uh, reduce these stigmas and perhaps improve 
mental health as we go. And that's a topic of conversation all in itself. But, you know, if you, if you don't address the bigger issues, perhaps, then, you know, these things don't necessarily fall into the correct alignment. So we could get into all of this, you know, massively, but, you know, we're not going to change the world in, in one podcast. And it's also crucial, I think, for the welfare of our children that people really understand what's going on in the world as opposed to what the, the mainstream media is telling them. And I always say you get one life. When it's gone, it's gone. You can't like, oh, I just have another. No, it doesn't work like that. It, it's a, And if all you've ever known is the mainstream media narrative, you are never going to be an enlightened individual. And for me, that has been the crowning achievement of everything that I've ever, ever done. Um, way more important than flying, skydiving, traveling, military, university, what, whatever it, 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 it might be. But moreover, it's because it opens you up to seeing the truth and everybody should be allowed to see the truth. Yeah, so Jamie, how does it how does it work with your special forces background? Did, do I understand right you came up what what do you call it? Territorial? Or? Yeah, so I had a background as a reservist. Um I mean that's you know I sorry don't that to, that was the word I meant. Yeah so for the record I I didn't serve as a regular soldier sort of full time. I did periods where I did sort of stints that were full time, but um, it was all kind of reserve forces covenant of employment. And uh, initially I was um, uh, following a sabbatical actually um, from UK policing. So I formerly served with Thames Valley police as an officer um, back in the day in the sort of Milton Keynes, uh, Buckinghamshire region, as well as uh, a few different locations such as, Buckingham itself, a small market town, um, Oxford, Aylesbury. But it, so I, I, I did a period in the police and then I took a sabbatical, like an official career break, and then um, did a bit of global travel and a bit of expedition work, specifically with uh, my great passion for scuba diving. And I ran um, um, quite a big um, marine conservation expedition in the Philippines, in the deepest sort of south china sea and then um so following all of that and following the the travel bits and pieces i think i did a stint working in egypt and uh, briefly in the caribbean i then came back to the uk still on this uh, sabbatical and then i decided to do something a bit more structured and go off to university and do some study so i did a degree i did a ba honors in scandinavian languages i think i was probably spurred on by um some you know uh, family connection um, on uh, on uh, my mother's side and I was just really interested I was just curious uh, and also the fact that uh, obviously as par for a languages degree you know you get to to go to the host country typically and expose so to learn the language uh, but being um, Scandinavian I went to Norway because I sort of did my sort of major as it were in the language in, in Norwegian and so I lived in Norway off. I can snack a little Norsk, Mr. Will. I can, uh, I can drink a little oil or, or snack a Norsk uh, with salmon, Mr. Will. So I can, I can speak um, somewhat fluent, albeit a little bit rusty Norwegian now. And I lived in, um, in deepest Norway in an area that was close to the mountains, um, close to an area called the Jotunheim, or mm -hmm. basically the Norwegian Alps. Um, very um, famous in military circles for the... Absolutely, um, yeah. I mean, not far away, you've got the Hardanger Vida or the Plateau, mm -hmm. Hardanger Plateau, where, which was famous for, um, you know, the heroes of Telemark escapades and um, those critical missions against um, the German occupation in Norway during World War II when they went in and basically sabotaged, so allied soldiers of the... Um, if you know the history, so Op Grouse, Operation Grouse, Op... Op Gunnerside, Grouse and Gunnerside missions, uh, or rather patrols, went in and they um, very famously and successfully executed a mission to sabotage the heavy water plant that the Germans had occupied and they were producing or manufacturing heavy water, 
which was going or deuterium oxide, which was going to it's a primary component or ingredient of the atomic bomb. And that was a real worry for certainly for the for the UK government, um, because if the um, if the Germans had produced enough heavy water to manufacture the atomic bomb, then they already had the long range V2 rocket capability. Uh, which was capable of long range sort of fire, uh, essentially from, you know, it could have been perhaps from, from Norway or indeed Germany, and that could have reached, you know, sort of greater Europe and then some. So it was a huge concern, hence why those missions were really critical. It's not something that gets reported so often in, in British military history, but really, really important all the same. And so I learned about all of this when I was living in Norway and I did a lot of these, uh, I followed similar routes on the ground as a, as a younger skier. And um, I used to love all that. I used to love all the, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, packs on your back and uh, the, the Langlauf, so the walking on skis across mm. the, the Norwegian Alps and the mountains. And I, I was in my absolute element and, um, you know, thinking can about I just, some of that history. Can I just chip in as because I've lived in Norway on and off for about four years. Yeah. What an utterly beautiful part of the world. Amazing. Beautiful. And the sense of community there and uh, really strong. The beauty of the landscape, you know, the mountains and the fjords. Um, and and I, I mean, I had a whale of a time, honestly. And that was the pull for me um, to do this particular degree course because I got to go and live in Norway for that year and and have a lot of fun and games so I pretty much attached myself to a center that was uh, you know we were learning a lot of skills such as sort of uh, mountain rescue and and I and I and I did um, a lot of skiing a lot of ski touring I even took my dive gear so I'm a keen scuba diver that I mentioned and I was an instructor with Paddy I had that ticket and I took my gear out and then literally within a space of a few months I mean, I started off doing solo dives in the fjord, which is okay, you know, but it's never tremendous fun on your own. And then the locals were kind of watching in awe. I mean, I'm talking 20 years ago now. Um, and I ended up teaching the locals. Um, they came out of the woodwork to sort of watch and observe. And at one stage, there's me sort of breaking holes in the ice uh, because it obviously froze over in the winter. And... Um, you know, I'm putting a weighted line or a rope down through the, through the aperture, the, the big hole that I'd made sort of with bricks and sticks to cut through the ice. And, and then I'd just pop down there. I had my dry suit on and my sort of thick neoprene hood and the, the sort of the, 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 the webbed gloves, you know, mm -hmm. to that which, kind of style of webbed gloves. Which dry suit have you got? Uh, so it was a, I had a trilaminate sort of butyl, this kind of old, um, rubber slash nylon thing and it was great up until the point when it started leaking so during the course of uh, the year she started to um infill with water from time to time and that got a bit miserable um but luckily she started leaking like much later in the season when the spring sort of summer on its way so the weather the, the, the water rather was getting a little bit milder um but yeah just all in all it was um uh, Norway for me was one big adventure playground and I absolutely capitalized on the entire year. Um, and I was a sort of mat mature student, as it were, on sabbatical from, from the police at the time. So I was, what, mid-20s. And I guess I was in my prime, absolutely capitalized on the moment of just being there in the moment, living there and trying to learn this um, quite tricky language. Um, but I just loved it i mean i the people i found were very warm very sort of embracing the strong community spirit and a wonderful adventure playground like i say and um uh, if i yeah, say I'd to you to anyone i'm trying to think of the the way their grammar works if i say does that make sense um Hem something about have you have, have, have i been burnt no tricker drink Oh, drink yeah. Drink do. Drink you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drink do. Hembrent is. Uh, Hembrent. Oh, um, oh, homebrew. Yeah. Yeah. Did I? I might have said it's been a yeah. long time since I've been over there, but yeah, it it it's that thing that um, 
that alcohol traditionally has always been so expensive in, in Scandinavia. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, that's a really fair point, actually, because only it was a bit of downtime, sort of typically on a, on a nice uh, Saturday evening or whatever. And, you know, we, there was a one little bar down in, this, in the town where I was based. And they called it from memory. They called it Mayaria, which is trans, literal translation for like the old dairy, and or the old dairy house because it was formerly like you know they were probably milking cows there back in the day because it was a really traditional sort of rural town. A place called Songdal. If any of the Norwegians are listening in, in the Song or Fjordain uh, Filke or County. And anyway, down to the Mayaria on a on a Friday or a Saturday night, if I was lucky and I had a, a few krona to spend on, on beer. Uh, not that I had a lot to play with back in those days, but you know, you go down, you you'd sort of set yourself up to go down for a couple of drinks, but you go late, right? Because the beers were so hideously expensive and it was about 10 pound a pint. And that was back then. So God knows what it costs now. You'd have to sort of remortgage if you wanted a night out on the lash, but um, we could but buy we, the, the homebrew. So friends at home, in case you want what, Wondering what I asked him. I asked, did he drink home homebrew over there? Yeah. And it's basically this stuff. Moonshine. Oh, moonshine. Yeah, basically that's it. In the States, they call it moonshine. Yeah. This is why I um I, the publisher sent me this book because I saw it on their website and I said, Could I podcast this person? Because I'm I'm fascinated with all things a bit rebellious. And yeah, yeah. Of course, in, in Norway, you 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 get individuals that own a still. And they drip off this homebrew, put it in a two liter Coca Cola bottle or whatever. It, and yeah. Everyone knows someone in the village that does the homebrew, and you go oh, around, sure. pay them a few crowns. And this is just it. Yeah. And you basically stoke up on that for the first kind of uh, half of the evening. And perhaps at uh, nine, nine or half nine or something in the evening, you'd basically rock up at the local bar. I mean, there was only this one bar in town, it was a bar slash for the nightclub next door. But it was, it was just, it, it, it seemingly all rather innocent uh, because it was, you know, very rural com community, but great, great fun. And um, yeah, there was, a, there was always a few, few sort of uh, nights, nights in this local establishment that I remember. <laughs> but I, I had a lot of fun and games in general, sort of living in Norway, and it was a tremendous life experience. And um, I feel quite privileged to have lived that slightly alternative life and that slightly alternative culture in my younger years that um, resonates um, strongly with me when I look back. And um, yeah, no, I recommend anyone, uh, particularly if you're looking for something a little bit different, go spend some time in Scandinavia, travel around because it's, in, it's a stunning country. And um, there's just outdoor, the outdoor world, the outdoor scene there is just phenomenal. If you like skiing, if you like hiking, if you like uh, any kind of water sports, um, it's all on your doorstep, you know. Yes, yeah, amazing, mate, amazing part of the world. Um, moving back to your um, special forces story, so I'm I'm assuming what did you? Uh, is it twenty one SAS? Is that there? Yeah, so that came a little bit later. So initially, so how I kind of got into it all was um, I, I originally. So I actually through my time at university, I, I joined uh, something called the Cambridge University Officer Training Corps. And um, this was a, a great uh, unit um, whereby you could get proper exposure to what the British Army had to offer. And I did some wonderful things. Like I went on these, what they call FAM visits. So they were like familiarization visits to, 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 to cut around uh, different um, regiments and corps of, you know, indeed the British Army. And so it might be artillery one weekend, or it might be kind of a, uh, you know, a, a chance to, practice sort of inf infantry skills. Uh, you know, we were perhaps hosted by the Royal Anglian Regiment, which was the local unit up at um, Kings Lynn. And then they had, of course, the two battalions with the Vikings and the, and the poachers, so the first and second battalion of, of the uh, Royal Anglian Regiment. So we had, you know, uh, I think, I remember different PSI, so staff instructors within, within Cambridge OTC had different skill sets. Some, some guys might have been... Um, warrant officers in Remi, so Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers, and they'd organise a fan visit to the Remi. We'd do a fan visit to um, artillery, like I mentioned, down at Lark Hill and the camp, sort of down towards um, Salisbury. And we were working on the planes with you know, proper artillery assets of um, 
of the British Army. Um, and then later on, we did competitions. So, you know, it might be an infantry competition, for example, Cambrian patrols across the sort of the boggy mountains of Brecon and, and, and Black Mountain in Wales. Or we might do um, a competition towards the end of the summer with the King, King George VI gunnery competition with, with, the, um, with the Royal Artillery for the Army. So altogether, fantastic exposure, bit of a recruitment workshop for the British Army, meaning you know, they were interested to sort of hire you prospectively as a junior um, officer, perhaps as a reservist, or indeed to go forward for, for regular commission. Um, and then moving on from sort of OTC antics, I got the opportunity to, uh, to do a number of courses. So interesting, my CO was pretty pro and on side. So he recognised that I was quite keen as an individual. He sent me back and forth to Norway a few times. And I did like some ski courses with the British Army. I think I did a um, skiing instructor's course eventually. I did an STLs course, a ski tour leaders course. It was basically like ML, but on skis in the mountains. Um, these are all like joint services kind of tickets or courses that you can go off to do. Um, I did driving courses all the way to like, you know, class one sort of HGV one. I did some sailing courses um, to, to, to day skipper level I, I did. And then, um, I think I did a PTIs course. And then, so I really, you know, took, took advantage of what was on offer and, and the time that was available because it was great focus for me, you know? And then the two highlights for me with OTC was, um, in my penultimate year, um, that was of university. So year three, um, I then, I put myself forward. So I volunteered to go forth to do the, um, the P company, uh, course, which was the, the British army regimental selection for the parachute regiment. And I went up to Catterick in North Yorkshire and, um, that course I found was utterly nails. So I went through as a, a, a junior or so a white t-shirt officer cadet. So I got a little bit more scrutiny and a bit of a tough time of it. And um, as a white t-shirt, I pretty much got, you know, the full, the full kind of horrors and, and, and pretty, pretty much beaten up and subjected to a, a, a lot of criticism um, at various intervals of the course. But I found it utterly um, challenging and extremely character building when it really digs deep. Um, but I surprised myself. I got through it. Um, I felt like by the skin of my teeth because I felt like I was being beasted within an inch of my life pretty much morning and afternoon, you know, every day of the week for some three weeks duration. And I did get through the process and that culminated with in the test week with the all arms uh, P company selection program. And then following that, I probably developed that little bit more confidence and I, I went forward for um, the, uh, the short service commissioning process with the Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. So that was a, about another, about a month's course um, down at, in, in Camberley in, in Surrey. So then that was, that was the very sort of end of my sort of OTC era. And I'd pretty much exhausted, you know, the, the, what I could potentially do within that, um, within that group, within that, um, within that core, if you will. And then it was put to me, actually, it wasn't necessarily my idea. Um, you'd think it would be, but it was actually put to me that, um, you know, I'd give, I'd had, you know, relative success with P Company, with, with, uh, with Sandhurst and stuff like, you know, been on a couple of Cambrian patrols at that stage, you know, these patrolling premier sort of infantry patrolling competitions with the British Army and had some success with a, a bronze and a, and a silver medal. So my superiors and the staff instructors and the commanding officer at Cambridge turned around and said, you, know, you might want to consider going forward for um, selection for UK SF. So this is how it, it sort of came about. And I thought, I thought about it at first and I was quite daunted by the prospect because, you know, you'd, you'd heard about the, 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 the likely statistics of, you know, those that were successful versus those that weren't typically successful. And of course I'd read a few books, you know, sort of, uh, you know, good old, uh, you know, Andy McNabb sort of Chris Ryan sort of era with some of those, um, 
those uh, narratives that were coming out in the 90s. And I'd read some of these books when I was a bit younger. And so I thought, Christ, you know, I don't know if that's for me. And the likelihood is I'm probably going to fall by the wayside and get binned. But actually, it's a different, um, in my experience, sort of humbly, sort of going through the processes, um, it's actually contrary to a lot of what you think. And you don't naturally necessarily get binned off of the program. If you're going to fall by the wayside, as it were, as an individual and not get through, it's primarily because you choose to voluntary withdraw or VW from the process, um, as the terminology goes, uh, because you pretty much lose heart. And that I saw that and I witnessed that in a lot of individuals and absolutely, you know, um, hands down, I very much, um, you know, on occasion, sometimes felt like I didn't necessarily have the metal or the stuffing to be able to pull through all of that. Because for me as a reservist, it was actually a 13 month program. And there was many times when I felt like I maybe should consider throwing the towel in, but there was something innate within me that refused to let go. So I was a bit like a sort of, uh, to give you an analogy, I was a bit like, you know, a little Yorkshire terrier. Because I'm not a big guy, you know, sort of average sort of height guy, sort of 72 kilograms, sort of five foot 10, quite a natural racing snake. But I was like that little, you know, Yorkshire terrier on the end of a rope. And you know, when the owner dangles the rope and the terrier bites on, and then the owner perhaps lifts this little rope into the air and you've got the terrier sort of hanging off it by his teeth. Well, that was the analogy that I would use. I, I just held on at all costs. I just refused to allow myself to cave in to the pressures because I knew that I'd been through these different processes that I'd described in the lead up to all of this. And that did help me. That helped me a lot because I thought, well, if I've been through this process and then that process, then surely there's something about me that, that should be able to hold on. And then the truth is, if you can hold on for long enough, and it's not easy, make no bones, it's definitely not easy, but 13 months, you know, and if you've got that hunger and that will to hold on, then as I found out, you might just surprise yourself. So from my observations, a lot of, you know, peers and contemporaries that I perhaps went through the selection process with, uh, perhaps just lost heart or perhaps, you know, they've got other pressures in their life that were really pressing, like put it family or employers or let's just say other commitments that, that perhaps were taking precedence in their mind. And where, whereas SF should have been taking precedence because it, it has to. And if you don't put that at the forefront and stay hungry, then the chances are you will probably lose heart. You'll start to make excuses and then, you'll kind of drop off the curve with the kind of pressure of it all, as it were. Um, so it's not necessarily rocket science, I, I, I would suggest. And it, it's not impossible, but as an individual, you do have to really, really want it. But there's many examples in life where you have to really want something, whether it's, you know, you're following an educational path or you're, you're perhaps putting all your, you're throwing everything in to perhaps learn a new trade um, and get qualified. You know, there's just many times in life where if you want to achieve and if you want to, to make something of yourself as an individual, then you really just have to hold on. And if you hold on for long enough, then you might just surprise yourself with the process. So that's the, the sort of take on that. And that's probably the lesson that I would have, you know, for anybody really. Um, so, yeah, um, I mean, it's by no means a boast because yes, I was successful with, the SF process as a reservist. And I ended up joining and getting badged into uh, 2-1 SAS as par or under the umbrella of, of UK special forces. But I, I never actually for the record got to really utilize that. I never really necessarily went anywhere in the operational sense. So this is, you know, um, something that I was looking back, you know, I slightly regretted because I put, in essence, I'd been a reservist for about seven and a half years. And five of the latter years I was with, with uh, 2 one SAS. And I was due to go on an operational deployment. And I'd been in that unit or that regiment for five years. And I'd done all sorts of training all over the world. And let's just say that I'd been to lots of different environments from 
you know, sweaty sort of humid jungle to, you know, mountainous terrain to temperate environments across Europe and, uh, and uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, the deserts of North Africa to also, you know, a couple of different locations in the, in the extreme sort of northerly latitudes of the Arctic circle. So I got to, to really test myself as a soldier within, within that sort of uh, specialism of, of SF in different environments all around the world. And I suppose the, the interesting thing was I, I perhaps worked in temperatures from minus 45 Celsius to probably on the flip side, sort of plus 45 degrees Celsius in, in the sort of the warmer climates. And really, you know, tough, brutal, physical environments that, you know, a human could operate in. And what did that really teach me? Again, it was all about holding on. Because just because you get through selection doesn't mean to say that, you know, it's going to be a walk in the park. I mean, the reason why they, the selection is, is quite tricky and it's quite tough is because ultimately when you're in the patrols, you need to know and you need to learn how to just hold on because the work is quite, um, um, you know, it's, uh, it's um, you know, there's an element of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, but endurance that you have to have to operate in those different environments. And, and that sort of hunger to be able to dig deep. So that's what my time in the, in the services really taught me. It was about how to, to hold on, how to really you know, work hard, sort of dig deep, and ultimately find it within yourself to sort of pull that, um, that gritty work out of the bag and sort of make it happen for the sake of you know, your own role within the unit and that and, and, and par for the team with your oppos. That was what it was all about. Um, but then, you know, realistically for me as an individual, you know, interestingly, all of that that I'd done, all of those years of, you know, lung bursting, gut wrenching effort, little did I realize that, you know, in my, in my case, what was it all for? Well, it was really inadvertently, seemingly, what was going to set me up for the next phase of what I was going to encounter. And, you know, hands up, this was something completely abstract, completely out of the blue that just knocked me on my, you know, gluteus maximus, you know, and the rug got pulled from underneath me in terms of what happened next. So I, in the summer of 2007, and I mentioned I was just about to go on an operational deployment, um, with my unit and I'd been building up the training and, you know, sort of ramping up all of that effort. Mm. And we were told that we were due to deploy, but we had a bit of downtime. So I chose to go and fulfill um, an ambition is perhaps a lifelong ambition that goes back to sort of childhood. And I was um, very much inspired by my late grandfather who trained as a pilot. And he was also a bit of a spotter with, aviation and when, when I was a young kid he would take me to Luton airport to sort of observe the aircraft taking off in the distance the commercial aircraft and so this 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 idea that I perhaps wanted to fly one day it was it was there from a very young age and so that summer 2007 when I was told that I was going to be volunteering and I was going to be heading out to operational deployment um, I wanted to fulfill that ambition to learn to fly now I didn't necessarily have long. We're talking about a six week window to try to make it happen. So I decided to not just walk the walk, but to talk the talk. So the first um, thing that I needed to achieve was to go to the U S embassy in London and to try to persuade the authorities that I was uh, uh, not some kind of risk because remember this was in the aftermath of nine 11 and um, you know, to specifically want to go to, Florida in the States to learn to fly uh, because I was, you know, the likelihood was I was going to fulfill the ambition and, and have that strong kind of meteorological time frame, that window to get the flying done. And hopefully I wasn't going to get rained off sort of three or four days a week. And that was the risk if I was perhaps training in, in the UK. What, what year was this, mate? So that was the summer of uh, specifically, we're talking sort of July, August of 2007 in the summer of gosh and you were there you were there just after me i i did my flying training in i think it's 2005 in in florida yeah it would have been probably 
you know, a couple of years after you, Chris. But I, I, you know, but from what I understand, I definitely wasn't as successful as you in this uh, in this arena. So I went off and um, and and I'd been so I embarked on this comprehensive flying training program to do my uh, my training, my PPL, and um, on this one particular day. So I'm going to fast forward now about a month into the process. So I'm now pilot in command and I'm, I'm solo and I've been solo for about eight days. And on this one moment, I'm working up in the pattern, um, sort of doing my sort of movements up in the pattern. I'm at 1000 feet indicated and I'm looking at the altimeter in front of me on the dashboard. And all of a sudden I looked sort of general observation. I was looking left, looking right, looking forward. And as I looked at my left hand canopy window, I saw a thin streak of visible yellow orange flame. And it was clearly emanating from the front portion of the fuselage. So the front aspect of the aircraft itself, a light aircraft, single engine piston. And as I looked and looked again, I sort of did a double take. I've got my left hand on the control stick, my right hand on the throttle. And as I'm banking round to my left and then sort of downwind, crosswind, and then final turn into wind, the fire externally that I'd witnessed outside through the canopy window breached the cockpit internally and um, suddenly I looked down at my feet working on the rudder pedal sort of left and right and I looked down I could see the yellow flame sort of breach and the flames were lapping around my feet and my ankles so you know um, I won't deny that initially there was starting to be this fluster and this panic in my mind and I'm starting to take stock of what's going on inside the small two-seater chamber um, you know, cockpit of the aircraft. And I'm thinking about everything that's going on. It's literally and sort of figuratively getting quite sort of heated in there as I'm trying to process what's going on and this um, emergency. And as I'm descending and I'm just trying to sort of hastily bring the aircraft down towards the, the threshold, so the landing point in the distance for the active concrete runway below in the distance. But as I'm descending, um, the flame was starting to build up. So as I'm watching altimeter and it gets down to 700, 600, 500 feet thereabouts, the flame was about now half the height of the chamber of the cockpit. So it's roughly about sort of belly height as I'm sat in that left-hand sort of uh, skipper seat of the, of the light aircraft. And it was at that moment where the initial sort of fluster um, in my mind gave way to, okay, I've got a grip now and I know what it is that I've got to do and I've got a, a plan of action and that's what I needed. So I immediately just veered gently with the stick to my left. So I'm away now moving away from the concrete runway in the distance below and I'm just starting to glide in, uh, heading towards a grassy embankment. And then I immediately reverted back to my training and you know, it was the emergency uh, protocol or the emergency drill for the aircraft. And I remember followed the train. So I just turned the key off, the um, key to the ignition off, the red switches for magnetos, alpha and bravo off, off, the master switch off, the lights off, the strobes off. In the uh, center column, there's a fuel pump. I flicked that switch to the off position, rotate the fuel selector valve through 90 degrees off. Uh, I'm still gliding in left hand on the control stick, right hand on the throttle. So I've knocked off the throttle now and I'm scrubbing as much airspeed as I can, just sort of gently flaring to sort of reduce airspeed as much as I dare. And then I ripped off my headset quite low level, just a couple of hundred feet, threw it in the opposite footwell because the comms with the tower below was futile because I was so low level. And I remember probably the most extraordinary and important piece of information and advice that I'd received from one of the U S instructors was, you know, if there's a problem, if there's an emergency fly the damn aircraft. And obviously what the guy meant by this was don't lose control and maintain control at all costs, particularly in an emergency concentrate on piloting and flying the aircraft. So having shut down everything and removed the headset and I'm now probably very low level about, um, you know, less than a couple hundred feet i carefully unbuckle the three-point harness so that's the buckle around my waist and i've got the the harness running over left and right shoulder and around my waist i unbuckle all of that wriggle out of it and then i i undo the left hand canopy door to my left 
And then I, that pops up to the vertical position, like a bit of a Lamborghini style door. And then very low level now. So I'm, there's more sort of wind coming in. And that was a bit of a double-edged sword because it kind of cooled the flames around my body, but the increased wind was actually growing the flames. So it was starting to aggressively grow the flames. And I can remember those last moments within the cockpit. I was literally sort of <laughs> in a vain bid to sort of protect my airway from flame ingress because the flames were lapping my face now. And one eye shut in a bid to protect my eyesight because I didn't want them to get too damaged from the flame. And um, an extremely low level, so 50 feet, 40 feet, 30 feet, looking left, looking right, looking forwards, looking for hazard, looking for obstacles, uh, approximately 20 feet. So I was like sort of, uh, I described it, I was kind of like Jack, Jack in the box, sort of Jack Rabbit. I, I managed to clamber quickly onto the seat and then open through the open door aperture. So got out onto the left wing and stood momentarily looking only at the horizon, uh, not looking down. And then I took a giant leap from the trailing edge of the left wing Snap my feet and knees together in the air, hands above my head. And I said, look only at the horizon. And I jumped. So off the back of the left wing. And I was probably running in at about 30 knots, estimated. And, and I was probably no more than about 1.5 or 15 feet um, when I made that jump from the left wing of the aircraft. And the motivation for that was the fact that I was on fire at that stage um, from head to toe. So I landed sort of boom in the, the long grass. I, the intention was to sort of power roll um, out of the jump, you know, when I hit and made contact with the ground, but it was, um, it was too fast and it was too sloppy. And, and in all sincerity, I sort of thrust forwards. I smashed my face in a secondary impact with the long Florida sort of razor grass. And so that was a secondary impact. I had a bilateral nasal fracture, super orbital eye socket fractures to both eyes. I had a multiple soft tissue lacerations from the sharp grass uh, to the right side of my nose, to the alar, through the lip, to the face. Um, and I think I popped a collarbone as well. And my left index finger, I don't know if you can make that out, but that sort of hyperextended and fractured um, awkwardly on contact with the ground. And, but that's not the worst of it. The, in the action of the jump, I'd inadvertently ruptured the colon. So that's the large intestine in the, in the torso area, the colon. Um, and I also lacerated my, my liver internally, uh, which was now hemorrhaging and bleeding profusely and causing me some, some real problems there. But on top of all of that, and I said the motivation for, for the jump uh, was the fact that uh, I was on fire. And for the record, I was 63% third and fourth degree burns. And that was the showstopper and indeed the career stopper for me. So, you know, as I mentioned, I might have been, you know, formerly that guy uh, that served with, with, you know, UKSF. But in a moment, in, an, in, in the moment that I described of perhaps 45 seconds of my life and the burn, that rug got pulled. And uh, it's not a sob story, but it's just to say that um, my life was literally never going to be the same again. Now, this is where I got exceedingly lucky because having um, extinguished the right shoulder and patted that out on the ground uh, and the right scalp, which was still on fire like a Roman candle, I patted that out. You can see the extensive damage that I had there. Um, I was able to um, quickly get myself into a sort of fetal position on the ground, but I was kind of watching through my spread fingers. And I just caught a glimpse of the aircraft in the distance, probably about uh, no more than a couple of perhaps London double-decker buses, you know, the big red buses away from me. And she was nose heavy, left wing down. And the propeller was actually still about uh, about six feet uh, above the ground, so roughly the height of a man. And I physically watched my own aircraft crash land into the ground and then subsequently 
after a short pause, boom, an almighty explosion. And I was just outside the fire radius of that, and uh, but not outside the shockwave. And I remember that shockwave going through me and back again. I then desperately tried to crawl away in the long grass to make distance uh, just to get to get further away from the heat in the inferno. And I managed to probably get about 15 feet or so, not far. And I was utterly exhausted. I had nothing left to, to give. And I just waited and I grew cold and I was recognizing shock. So we're talking deep systemic shock perhaps fluids were running out of my body at a rate of knots that you know i i couldn't comp comprehend or, or really fathom it was a hideous time and the pain washed over me like a giant tsunami wave the pain was off the charts sort of indescribable and i didn't in all sincerity believe that i was going to be able to hold on because you know you imagine all the fights that i'd ever been through you know, with all the sort of military kind of training that I'd done and all the sort of selection processes. And this was like, you know, you know, to the power of 100 in terms of pain and suffering over anything that I'd ever been through in my former sort of adult life uh, and all that sort of training that, that preceded. And, and I honestly didn't think I was going to be able to hold on. And I, was hyperventilating with the pain and I grew so cold, even though the hot Florida sun was beaming down on me. And um, so I took my shoes and socks off and I thought to myself, you know, this is one journey I'm not going to need shoes and socks for. And I tucked everything in neatly laces socks, put it by the right hand side of me on the ground. And I crossed my arms across my chest because the pain in my torso, remember some of the damage that I described, was really excruciating pain. And I found that by putting my arms across my chest and lifting my knees up to my chest and then gently laying back in the long grass, that offered me some, some subtle respite from all the pain in, in the torso area. And then just to my sheer, you know, I guess, um, astonishment, really, um, I heard this sort of woo, 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 in the distance. And I knew that the authorities and the services were coming for me. The, the sirens grew louder and clearer. And, um, and again, I waited and perhaps within about 15 minutes. So I think that I'd been holding on for as long as 15 minutes before the paramedics arrived on the scene. And those boys um, very diligently um, must have jabbed me with a morphine syret because trust me, life suddenly felt pretty damn good. But I know in my, in my subconscious that it was very bad. I mean, it was extremely grave situation. And I knew that I was very badly burned from head to toe. And I, and I also, the irony is here that I was also a qualified a patrol medic. That was something that I specialized in, sort of paramedic level uh, within, within my role within the army. Um, I, I'd sort of specialized with, with the unit. And, and I understood implicitly what, it meant for a human being to be up against um, large third degree burns. And I knew that was me at that time. And I didn't honestly believe that I had, that I was going to likely make it. However, um, I got very lucky because they airlifted me from the scene. So paramedics in the ambulance were on scene within 15, perhaps within another five minutes, there was a helicopter on the ground and they put me into the back of a chopper. I can remember that sort of, Whoop, 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 and that oscillation from the chopper and we're sort of heading off up into the uh, the um, Orlando airspace and I got transported by chopper about 20 25 minutes and I went to uh, Orlando Regional Health Center which was arguably one of the top trauma facilities on on the planet um, because Florida is a bit of an adventure playground and they do um, happened to receive quite a number of big burns patients um, certainly on an annual basis. So the doctors are very well versed and practiced in what they do. And they received me and um, I was pretty far gone in my mind. I was thinking, you know, this is not a life that I want. Um, I was quite happy to sort of check out. And indeed I was asking them for, for help in that respect to sort of just put me out of my misery really and sort of end it. And whatever it took, you know, I was prepared to sign on the dotted line. Um, but 
history was, if you like, written that day in the sense that, um, you know, the, one of the, uh, you know, the, the decisions was to actually take me down to theatre, as it were, and to put me under. And, and, and in actual fact, they put me under for a period of six months. So it's a very long, uh, protracted period of uh, traumatic recovery. But my God, they're very good at what they do. And, you know, and luckily for me, I was in the prime of my life still. Uh, you know, I just turned 32 years of age. And I had that real fight within me. Um, and with the intervention from the doctors and the specialists and indeed all the nurses in Orlando, many, many months later, I was able to sort of pull through the acute phase of the trauma, but albeit, you know, having gone through, you know, the worst of the worst. I reached the very lowest ebb of humanity and where you can go to. So I'm talking pneumonia, uh, septicemia, um, renal failure, um, all manner of complex um, infections, you know, to, to the body and, uh, and, a, and a myriad of different surgeries. So I had, um, I faced in all, um, so six months drug induced coma, two years inpatient stay within the hospitals within um, both the US and the UK respectively. I had uh, 62 operations under general anesthetic uh, about three years of physical healing, if you can get your head around that, and about five years of probably, you know, psychological um, recovery and acceptance to what had happened to me and to therefore coming to terms with the, the new body in the new skin and the new life. Because my life changed um, dramatically. You know, I went from being that kind of elite soldier to, you know, to ground zero. And I had to you know, um, you know, um, absolutely fight back from the very, very lowest ebb, like I mentioned. And it was a tremendous fight and a tremendous ordeal. And, and to this day, I'm not quite sure how realistically I was able to achieve that. Um, but all I will say, it probably harks back to, you know, what I was talking about um, perhaps earlier, or perhaps it was in a former conversation with you that, it's all about will and determination. And if you have the ability to, to, to hold on and then you, you know, realistically, you might just surprise yourself. And that's what I learned coming through this process that, um, you know, ultimately, you know, I had to really dig, especially deep, like way deeper than I'd ever dug before. Remember I talked about some of the processes that I'd been through in life, but this, this situation or this ordeal put that into the shadows, you know, everything in my life in terms of what I thought was tough and suffering and perhaps pain, this ordeal, you know, it, that it, it, it put everything into, into the shadows really. And, um, and, and it was, it was monumental in, in terms of what I had to come through and that, that will and that, that uh, process of holding on. And so that was what I learned that that's what I kind of became. And that's what, I guess I'm all about now in terms of sharing um, the wider story with the, the hope um, and the belief that I, I, I can help people with that. And so I'm all about sort of resilience and, um, uh, and, and what it is truly to be resilient and, and what it is truly to, to be able to hold on mm -hmm. and to, to perhaps uh, carve a new path for yourself as an individual. So, you know, from my humble experience, you know, what, you know, what, what I learned to understand is no matter how dark life may seemingly stoop, you know, we can all figuratively turn it around if we want it badly enough. And, um, and that, that's what it's all about in a nutshell. So, um, yeah, it's a new life and it's a new existence. Shall we, shall we say, as I mentioned in, in, in this new body, sort of version 2.0, it feels like a new body because I've had that many surgeries and I've been at the, um, the hands of so many different plastic surgeons, you know, both sides of the pond. Um, and I've had to accept it all. And um, I've had to accept that I look a bit different, you know, when I'm walking down the street and um, you know, that was a tough thing to swallow. I remember, you know, the first time I sort of stepped out in public you know, away from the hospital and, you know, you look a bit different and people are suddenly looking at you and 
looking at you again. They're sort of doing a double take in the street. Uh, admittedly, you know, the face was a lot more swollen and uh, sort of, you know, looking traumatised back then. It sort of settled down an awful lot and the scars have uh, sort of blended in a bit more. But I, I always going to look different and um, I accepted that change of appearance and, um, you know, um, life is certainly worth living. But I also learned that, you know, you've got to grab it by the horns once again and set yourself new goals, new challenges. And that's what I did. And that's what uh, I was able to go on and do. So that's really the story in a nutshell, Chris. Gosh, a million questions. Ironically, and don't hate me for this, but some of them, some of them are about the, 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 the piloting procedure and what, what was going through your mind. But let, let's take that uh, later. And let's, let's start with, it all sounds just, not just utterly incredible, I mean, my God, jumping from burning planes is I used to watch the Bionic Man as a kid. And that was the sort of thing you saw in, uh, uh, you, you know, from from Hollywood. But the the trauma you went through as an incident um, is on, on such a magnitude that I just, I don't, I don't, I don't even know if I'm able to try to get my head around it. And what I want to know is, was there a point at which the trauma became pain or the trauma became depression or, 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 or did it, you know, did, did your experience get worse with anger? Um, I mean, let's just use someone else as an example. So Mark Ormrod, who I'm sure you're probably familiar with, a former Royal Marine, lost three limbs in Af Afghanistan. He was remarkably sort of chipper for someone that's just lost three major parts of his body. And I have no doubt that there were, you know, lots of tears and lots of soul searching, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately he just looked himself in the mirror and went, right, okay, let's crack on. And, and, he seems to have done a really remarkable job of that. Yeah, I know Mark. Um, he's an extraordinary bloke. Um, I'm sure he won't mind me saying that. Um, but even though I know that you bootnecks, Royal Marines, you don't necessarily uh, like to be put on a pedestal necessarily. But, uh, you know, you've got generally an extraordinary mindset and that sort of tenacity. But I remember the first time I saw Mark uh, many moons ago, I think I'd heard about him or seen him on social media or whatever. And being a keen diver, I actually went to the um, uh, the London dive show at the time. And I think it was like um, Earl's Court. And so I rocked up for, on, on the Saturday or whatever. It's Saturday morning. I see this fella in clearly in prosthetic limbs um, in the distance in the in the hall. And, um, and as I got closer, I see a guy not just in with prosthetic um, limbs, but also a prosthetic arm. And he's dishing out leaflets and he's going up along the row of seats, one after the other, putting a leaflet onto every seat. And he's going up and down the aisles. And I thought, gosh, I think I recognize that guy. It's Mark Conroy. So I went up and sort of introduced myself and we got talking. And it just dawned on me, you know, because he's extraordinary that, um, you know, you know, ordinarily you'd see some able-bodied person doing that, putting the leaflets out on all the chairs. But, you know, Mark's uh, very driven. And I think that was testimony to the character of and the caliber of the guy. That even back then, this was years ago, that he was there going up and down the rows, chucking out all the leaflets on the seats. And I mean, since then, I know he's gone on to do incredible feats and, you know, sort of, uh, you know, sort of walking events and he's doing a swim or something, some, some big uh, sponsored swim in the pool. And yeah, he just, he just never stops. And, and that's the tenacity. That's the mindset. And, and again, you know, uh, if you've got that hunger, if you've got that will, no matter what's happened, you can surprise yourself. You can still go on and achieve incredible things. I mean, fortunately for me, you know, I, I wouldn't allow the, the injury to dictate my legacy. And even though I'm not going to be that kind of elite sort of soldier, you know, as 
sort of part of the service with UKSF or whatever. Now, those days were numbered. I had to accept that. No way I could run with the squadron anymore with the injuries that I had. And, um, but no big deal, you know, because right, you've got a slightly adjusted toolkit, um, but you can still do stuff with the new toolkit, albeit perhaps at a different pace. And, and I was able to go on and similarly, you know, like Mark, I was able to do challenges and events. I did, you know, London Marathon. And it took me a long time. I did it in like eight, eight hours 30 because of the injuries to my lower limbs were pretty debilitating and slowed me down a lot. But I was able to go on and sort of improve upon that. I lived in New York. So I did a 7.07 time and then my very best effort in London on a third marathon occasion. Um, and it was actually my last one, but I did 6.15. And it's not so much a boast, but just to show that people that, you know, again, with the will and determination, irrespective of disability, if you want something and you're hungry enough, you can still pull something out of the bag and you can still participate. And for me, that's what it's all about. It's not about, you know, collecting the medal or sort of breaking the record or, you know, um, you know, trying to sort of, you know, be at your sort of, you know, pinnacle point in life. But you, you it's about achieving your goals and dreams irrespective. I mean, I've been able to go on and retrain as a pilot and, and do challenges and events all, all over. And if you want something, you can do it. You've just got to want to do it. And, and that's, that's the testimony really, you know. So I want, I want to just go back to be they an induced coma that, that just sounds a, insane in itself i mean i don't even know how doctors manage someone in that state when you bear in mind they can't be eating or drinking so i guess it's all coming from a tube and then what what nutrition do you put in that tube that isn't going to make them even more sicker than they they already are there's there's so many yeah i mean it, it, it was complex with drug induced coma there's an awful lot that goes on i mean I was fed through a tube, a yellow tube, up into my nasal sort of pharynx, down into my um, stomach directly. So, you know, you're fed sort of uh, liquid food products for the duration of the time that I was in the induced coma. And I was intubated. So you see a scar here in my sort of, uh, um, in the sort of lower sort of portion of the, the airway here. Um, and that meant that a machine was kind of effectively breathing for me. Uh, I became, you know, I, I quote, you know, forgive me, but I quote like a small aspect of my my own story, my own book, uh, Life yeah, on a Thread. Grab a copy um, of your book there, mate, if you've... Um, I, sorry, I don't have to... I, I don't... Sorry? Oh, no, that's not mine. Sorry, that's oh. somebody else's. Another another remarkable gentleman that um, sent me a book that I've just started reading, a guy called um, Ed Jackson here. Um, but he, he was sort of paralyzed as an ex uh, former rugby player, but was able to kind of go on and sort of turn his life around. But anyway, um, my own book I wrote and got published recently with Penguin life on a thread. Uh, and just to quote a very tiny aspect, um, he's not to sort of, uh, go on too much about that, but I became the adjunct of machinery. So a living receptacle for, machines, tubes, wires, and powerful pharmaceuticals. And that's what I became. And that pretty much says it all, really. When I give you a, just a small quote from the book to describe, you know, that very lowest ebb of where I reached, um, you know, on the, on, you know, uh, you know, as a recipient of, of acute medical care. And, and I was down and out for the count. And I was, at the mercy of the medics who are looking after me 24 seven doctors, nurses, specialists of all sort of, you know, all departments. And I had to, you know, in fact, I, I, I was completely, you know, um, unaware of what was going on because the remarkable thing about drug induced coma is that you're kept under um, a level where your actual conscious self is not aware of what's going on, but your subconscious self is still, fighting you know and and driving all bodily systems internally to keep up the good fight as it were but you haven't got a scooby 
um, sort of outwardly consciously of, of what's going on. And it's a remarkable process that I went through. And, and I guess, you know, in the, in the main sense that I didn't really suffer, or at least it didn't feel like I was suffering consciously. But the real work in my mind began after that initial six month period, because I was roused, you know, out of the drug induced coma and sort of awoken as it were. And I really had to dig very deep to sort of, to keep fighting and to keep up that daily uh, extraordinary uh, effort. So you wake up after six months. Well, that's what it felt like. I mean, don't forget, you know, the, 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 the period of drug induced coma, you're not asleep six months i mean you are you know you kind of live by a routine you know you're awake you're asleep you're awake but you don't really know what's going on because what they do is they use analgesia to keep your mind under at a certain point so you're you're pretty much uh you know semi sort of anesthetized and it's very clever um there was periods where i was sat bolt upright having conversations with people in the hospital but i could not tell you you know, the content of the, the dialogue of those conversations, because I was effectively still within that period of being drug induced. And um, there's periods where you're very much, then they, they titrate, they add a bit more um, analgesia and put you under that a little bit more. So you're in a deeper sleep to enable you to rest more. And so your body to be able to rest and fight more. Um, but it is extremely clever. And, and this period, like I said, this period for me went on for six months. But then um, the next phase was the sort of step down unit. So after the intensive care unit, and that was a high dependency unit step down where you're awake now and you're fighting and you're conscious about what's going on. And that to me was the real fight because I had to, you know, live with the pain and suffering to a degree. And if I needed more um, in analgesia to help with the pain or, or whatever, I'd have to shout out for that, you know, and um, and it became just a perpetual sort of daily nightmare. I felt like that mouse on that treadmill, kind of going around and around and around. But I, I wasn't necessarily making progress down the track, if you understand. That was how it was in my mind. That uh, you know, it was a sort of an endless fight with little progress. And and I think testimony to that is that I got about eighteen months down the road. So we're talking year and a half after the incident and the burn. And um, I just wanted to, to throw in the towel and I wanted to give up on, on life as I knew it. And, and I became enthusiastic actually about the prospect of assisted suicide. And I just generally didn't think that I had it in me to kind of keep going because I'd been fighting for so long. I said mouse on a treadmill for so long. And, and I challenge anybody, you know, when they were in the condition that I was to keep up that pretense and to just keep fighting day in, day out. Um, so there was a period where I really desperately wanted to check out. And I, I just, I had a, an idea, an ambition to, to sort of, to go through the process with Dignitas in Switzerland. And that's the route that I wanted to go down. But fortunately I had some help, um, some, uh, some help from uh, somebody from, from ministry and uh, from, you know, from a religious uh, um, sort of minister came to my assistance and offered me a bit of an ultimatum and sort of said that uh, he would help me and, and he would sort of help to transport me and take me. But, um, you know, I made a, I made a sort of a, a, a deal with him, if you will, that I was going to hold on for just one more calendar month. And then during that, that, uh, that, that, that uh, further month, uh, I was somehow able to turn a corner. I don't know how on earth I did it. Uh, it's a, it, it, you know, it, uh, it's beyond my comprehension, really, quite honestly, how I started to indeed turn a corner. But so let's just say some good things started to happen. And I went for sort of further surgeries and there was some good results on the horizon. And I started to, to see some healing progress. And then ultimately, I was able to see the light and um, look towards that and start to work towards the, the sort of nurturing process to to pull myself out of a long, dark tunnel. And a couple of years on, um, I eventually got out of the hospital then got home for the third year. And then I learned to, to, to sort of, uh, to feed, to, to write my name and to sort of walk independently, um, albeit with assistance at first, but, you know, um, I was able to really 
to pull it out of the bag and to go on and to be this this kind of version 2.0 as I call it and and you know um, and then the challenges and everything that came much much later and that was about more about the self belief and, and that that sort of nurturing process but yeah long road Chris and um, we get there in the end but Burns is probably you know I don't want to compare it I mean you know every um, um, you know respect goes out to my fellow um, service personnel that have been through, you know, tough ordeals in their own lives respectively. And they've obviously had their own challenges, um, whether they'd been blown up or, you know, amputations or, uh, you know, burns. I, you know, I know guys that have lost their eyesight and been sort of inadvertently blinded, but, you know, there were some tremendous challenges that so many of, of my fellow sort of contemporaries, uh, ex-servicemen and women have faced but you know again you know I think you know the testimony is that you know a lot of these individuals have shown great will great determination and great tenacity and they've sort of managed to pull it out the bag and and go on and live sort of interesting extraordinary and remarkable lives once again um, and so yeah it's, it's how much do you want it you know and that that's that's life in a nutshell really. How was it for your family when to, to hit how I mean how soon did they get out to, I'm assuming they came out to Florida yeah so um, I was lucky that uh, all my family in sort of stages came out um, my mother pretty much was uh, tremendous uh, support she was out living with me more or less 24 7 and and then when I got back to Chelmsford the Burns unit in Essex where they, they flew me back to Stansted and then transported me to Chelmsford Burns unit after America um, you know, my mum was there very, you know, based locally um, and, for, and supported by various kind of armed forces charities to enable her to sort of, you know, literally be at my bedside a, a lot of the time. And that for me was great, you know, moral, personal support. You know, I have a sibling, so I have a brother and a sister that were able to support me as well and visit. And my father, uh, when he was able to, because he, he, he was sort of busy working at the time. But yeah, I was lucky, you know, a lot of friends visited, you know, had sort of ex-service colleagues, friends that had visited and to, to give me some sort of moral support along the way. And um, of course, a lot of these visits in the early days, I don't even remember because, you know, I'm still in that sort of, um, you know, period of sort of drug-induced coma. So I was having visits even during that stage. I don't even necessarily remember the visits because of uh, the level of uh, sort of analgesia and, and sedative that I was under. Mm. Um, so yeah, tough times in, in retrospect. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think I, you know, I tried to turn it around and I tried to look at myself in the mirror as it were and, and realize that, you know, you know, I am a glass half full kind of a guy rather than, you know, glass half empty. And that I'm one of the lucky ones that it could have been a lot worse. I mean, I could have been far more disfigured I could have lost you know body parts I could have maybe not made it you know and so the fact that I'm here cracking on with life and living a somewhat relatively active life once again I count my blessings and I'm grateful for small mercies as it were and um, yeah I mean I'm intent on just making the most of you know the time I've got left and hopefully hopefully sharing sharing the you know the you know, those sort of motivational messages, you know. How has it been with the media? Because this is, a, a, I'll say it again, it, it's just such an extraordinary story. Um, I would imagine they were scrambling over themselves to, to get... I've had quite a lot of, yeah, I've had a lot of media input in recent weeks, especially. Um, I... You know, I mentioned the book that came out. So I got published with, with Penguin only in mid-May. So we're now only, um, uh, you know, sort of early July. So, so it's, been, it's only been about six weeks or so. And then uh, I had an initial scramble with the publicity. So I was doing bits and pieces for BBC, ITV, uh, you know, Chris Evans' breakfast show, um, and, and various uh, newspapers. So the, the Sun covered it, you know, the Mirror, um, the, the Daily Mail, and there was a lot of interest. And, and I mean, I'm still getting calls now. Um, I did a I did a piece recently for BBC Radio Four, 
on Saturday Live. And then um, I've got interest from, um, from um, I think, is it Outlook or BBC World Service? So I've got that sort of pending. And, and a lot of it, so it's some, it feels somewhat repetitive. But again, these are all quite interesting platforms. And again, if it helps me to sort of um, share the story and, and, and that can help people to a degree. You know, cliche as it sounds, but with the, the the motivation and help to you know to inspire people and to develop other people's sort of aspirations in life, then that's partly why I do what I do as a speaker and share it. And um, and the media, of course, you know, has has uh, shown interest and 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 played a role in my life up until now. And and, in, and indeed, in previous years, I've been doing a lot with the media on and off as an ambassador for Help for Heroes. I mean, that's a role that I've done now for the last eight years, um, you know, for and on behalf of the charity. So these are, this is important. The media is useful. Um, you try to take advantage of that in the same way as they try to take advantage of you as, as an individual with a story. It, it may not always be there. You know, you may, you may not always have opportunities. And I guess, you know, like, like a lot of people that are partly in the public spotlight, you do what you do. Um, for a period, I think while you can, and you just try to um, to to sort of go with the flow on that, you know, and um, um, and it can be useful. Hmm. On a technical point, did did you ever get as far as learning how to crab an aircraft? Learning how to, it's called crab. Oh, so, yeah, absolutely. So, in order to, you know. Um, basically lose altitude very quickly no no absolutely for sure but there was a risk with me the fact that i was only 1000 feet okay when the fire ensued and breached the cockpit there was a risk that um, i didn't have long in order to you know make a uh, or set myself up for a, um, a clean sort of natural glide into that new sort of flight path that I'd sort of given myself. Yeah. Um, and time is of the essence, especially when you're low level, you kind of need time to be able to control the aircraft. And I didn't want to lose massive height so quickly. So in terms of crabbing or slipping the aircraft to uh, sort of scrub off significant altitude quickly, that was an option, certainly but I needed time to follow the emergency protocol and execute the drill for that particular type of aircraft. So what I mentioned about that sort of shutdown procedure, I wanted time to be able to do that in a controlled manner and effectively, and then concentrate on the glide and really control that and scrub off the airspeed sort of safely uh, to a level that I was sort of comfortable did, with. Jamie, did you, had you realised at this point that you are going to have to get out and jump or were you yeah, I made the on? Yeah, so it's a good question. I made the decision quite early. It wasn't something that I thought very last minute. So I'd actually made that decision um, sort of relatively high still, albeit probably I was only you know 500 feet or so. And then I just was able to follow um, the protocol for that um, emergency procedure. And, and I... I feel that I got away with it by the skin of my teeth and, um, you know, a little bit of quick thinking, quick action. And then of course, making the jump, some might say sort of grace of God, sort of getting out of that cockpit on time. Um, but albeit, you know, the truth is the damage was done. I mean, if I believe that I didn't, I didn't, uh, you know, try to land it in the conventional sense, I would have been, you know, running in, in, with too much time and the likelihood is um, the fire within the cockpit would have absolutely overwhelmed me and, and undeniably got the better of me hence why I made the decision to sort of veer away and set myself up for the um, mm. the exit whilst I was still airborne uh, because it was a way for me to get out of that burning cockpit a lot quicker um, and yeah so I was incredibly lucky to be able to pull it off but um my 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 strong my absolute strong feeling was that if I'd have tried to land it in the conventional sense, I would have been overwhelmed, and I wouldn't have made it. And indeed, if that fuel feed had caught the um, the um, the fuel tanks of the aircraft, then I would have been an absolute goner. If if that fuel feed had caught the tank within 
you know, whilst I was still airborne. And, and that was delayed by virtue of the fact that I'd actually cut the fuel pump and turned off the fuel selector valve. So it did catch, obviously, once she'd piled in uh, and then subsequently exploded. Obviously, the fire had, had, had caught that, um, that tank then, and it, hence, hence the sort of bomb going off. But, um, yeah, that Is was the a- absolute fear for me that, um, that I was going to be subject to all of that. Is there an actual checklist for if your plane catches fire? Do you remember? Well, not necessarily for fire, but there was an absolute there was a there was a checklist for emergency, and that was the, the simple checklist that I followed. So it was a systematic shutdown, and in essence, I was following uh, the dashboard of the um, of the the cockpit from left to right. That's all I was doing, and that was the that was the checklist. So as I mentioned, you know, ignition, magnetos, um, master switch, strobes. Uh, lights, fuel pump, fuel selector valve. It was just a sequence. And the other bits were, were pretty much a no-brainer to me. So obviously the headset was a hindrance to me, so I needed to eliminate that, unbuckle the harness so I could mm-hmm. indeed clamber out, open canopy door, clamber out onto wing low level and go for it. And, and I guess the confidence to do that um, and to make that good old-fashioned sort of parachute exit style from the back of the left wing was perhaps born from the, um, the training that I'd received uh, as an ex-para myself. So I'd done a fair bit of that in different locations around the world. And, you know, of course, um, refresher training sort of year on year within my time within service. So it was a bit of a no-brainer to me and the confidence to make that jump um, certainly was, was, was came from all of that service and, and, and what I'd been doing. Uh, perhaps other people, it might it may not have been an obvious option, but for me, it was a it was an obvious and quicker way for me to to exit the aircraft. Gosh, it it's like I say, it's just it's beyond belief. It it it's that decision that saved your life. Clearly, um, do they have like again? It was a long time since I learned to fly, but do they have um? bloody fire extinguishers in the cockpit you there, there was an extinguisher in there there was an extinguisher in, in the in the cockpit but it was in an awkward place behind the um so i was in the left hand seat and this fire extinguisher was behind the passenger seat so it was in quite an awkward place within this particular mm. aircraft type and and in all honesty i didn't have the confidence to to sort of go for that um, and the fact that the fire ensued and built up quite quickly uh, it was my um, my sort of gut feeling, if you were, if you will, um, to, to 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 just follow that uh, that plan for emergency protocol and exit the aircraft that much quicker. Um, you couldn't maybe if I was a lot higher, maybe if I was significantly a lot higher above, you know, one thousand feet, I would have gone for the extinguisher. But I know that in doing so, it was in an awkward position. I may not have been able to even reach round. And grapple and, and, and retrieve that, uh, given that I'm in a three point fixed harness. Yeah. Um, so that was a bit of a problem. And and if I was a lot higher, I probably wouldn't have hesitated to to, to reach around and go for that. Um, but I remember, like I said, my mind flicked back to the advice that I'd received from the US instructors. You know, above all, fly the aircraft, meaning maintain control. Yeah. And so I was literally trying to do my best to maintain control and, and glide in sort of systematically and comfortably, um, albeit to a low enough level in order to, to make the exit and, and pull off that, um, that jump. Um, so and yeah, the, the, the fire's coming from the engine. So it's coming essentially from outside the plane through the, it, it had breached. So it breached, um, at the low point underneath where the, uh, the, the, the footwell was, yeah. In, in front of where my feet were um, operating on the rudder pedals. So that's where they, I'd seen the first alert, you know, the first breach internally. And then I'd witnessed that fire sort of building up. And I think testimony to this also in terms of my physical uh, medical injuries, my, my lower limbs and my shin, my, my front portion of, my, of both shins were very badly burned because they received the longest period of the burn. And... Um, and, and they actually received fourth degree burn. So what that means is there was exposed bone. So both tibia were actually um, 
somewhat exposed in the aftermath of the burn because the burn was so deep to the lower shins. So that's wow. fourth degree burns. Mm. And the only reason that could have happened was because the lower limbs took a long, significantly long period of burning. So like I said, the fire was building up within the lower reaches of the cockpit. So my lower limbs were burning for the longest period. Fortunately, the upper ex extremities here, so the neck and the face, were burning for the lesser period. Um, in, in, in rather than sort of 45 seconds, the face was probably burning for, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 seconds. Uh, and so luckily, I didn't have fourth degree burns to my face. Otherwise, you know, it may have been a whole different story. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, you know, for the rest of my life, I'm going to have like extremely, um, you know, very badly burned lower limbs and the scars that go with that. And the upshot was that was that I lost a lot of, um, in fact, I lost a whole muscle group. So I lost um, tibialis anterior, the shin muscle, and I lost deep perineal nerve in both my left and my right lower limbs respectively. So that I ended up with a bilateral um, neuropathy or bilateral foot drop as a result of that. My gosh. It's, it's, um, there's a lot of swamp in Florida, isn't there? It's a shame there, were, there wasn't any near you. That would have been, um, well, there's some ocean in the distance. I'll be, I'll be honest, but it was, it was, um, um, still, albeit a significant, uh, distance. We're probably talking, you know, just a few short kilometers away to the beach. But I was working, remember, within the, the proximity and the vicinity of this small municipal aerodrome or small mm -hmm. airport. What and there was no way that I had the height to, to extend myself out towards uh, the ocean. Otherwise, that might have been a credible option. Did you say it was near Orlando? Yeah, it was in the Orlando airspace region. So it was, out, it was, in, the lower, uh, re, it was in the lower remit of the um, Orlando Federal Airspace where it occurred. Yeah, it's an interesting situation over over there that a lot of people will buy a plane simply because it's quicker to get around than than driving tremendously popular um you know there are literally um from what i understand there are you know tens of thousands of um, private pilots in the states because like you said the states is so big and diverse and driving is not necessarily an option you know, certainly in, in perhaps some of the more um, rural aspects so for if, if people are somewhat affluent and, um, and they've perhaps got that inclination. Yeah, aviation is a, is a really uh, viable option for them to get from A to B. Um, and certainly it's a great place to, to, to fly. And, and you know, I, I'd, you know if, if I could have my time over again, I probably wouldn't change things. I'd, I'd probably want to go through that same sort of process uh, because it was a tremendous life experience up until that point. And, uh, you know, I'll forever have those memories of, you know, for sort of, of flying and... Um, sort of uh, experiencing the joy of solo flight um, in US airspace. It was a wonderful experience. Mm. When you're doing your public speaking, Jamie, what, what sort of questions are people asking you? What, 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 what are people finding fascinating or, or, or what are they curious about? I think that in general, I mean, a lot of people are, um, are fascinated by, you know, the perhaps the detail and the, the thought process behind the actual incident in that thinking under pressure, for example, they're you know, making concerted decisions under, under pressure when you're under distinct duress. Uh, so that comes into it. You know, I speak to corporates especially, and they'll, they'll talk about sort of, uh, you know, executing sort of mindful decisions under pressure. Um, so that's a thematic for, for corporates. Um, but also people are in, intensely sort of curious about you know the will to you know how do you hold on and how do you nurture a mindset to keep pushing and, and going on and uh, when your your back's against the wall as it were and you're you know you've got everything to sort of fight for um and and you know it's a uh, you know, that, that's something I think that people are very curious about is about the whole recovery. And again, not just the physical, but the, the psychological, you know, um, and that mindset, that, that ability to, to redevelop yourself and to, 
to reframe and to and to perhaps think outside the box and to go on and and develop a whole new life because I think that I've it's not really a boast but I think I've done a pretty good job at redeveloping my life I mean I could have quite easily you know thrown the towel in or even more tragically I could have turned to perhaps drink or narcotics you know drugs and 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 you know felt sorry for myself on the, on the contrary you know i decided to grab you know life by the horns and take advantages of um opportunities you know events and and sort of challenge myself going forwards and and actually live a you know a, a newfound you know um successful life all over again you know i was able to retrain in various different disciplines and pursuits and and yeah you know, and i think that's what fascinates a lot of uh, the uh, the groups that i speak to is that if someone like me can do it you know then i think there's a hope for a lot of people out there i mean even if you take the latest um, issues with the pandemic and covid um people obviously have lost a lot and they've lost a lot of liberty and uh and perhaps people have struggled to cope and they felt perhaps sorry for themselves and they found it difficult in terms of their own mental health mm-hmm. and and trying to hold on and have that resilience but i think whereby if i can perhaps interject a little bit with my own story and say look you know it's not so much of a boast but look this happened to me this was an extremely dark and undeniable episode of of my life and look if i was able to hold on and i was able to figuratively come through that from being sort of struck down from being sort of that guy that i mentioned to sort of ground zero um and and rebuild the life and sort of go on and retrain and 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 requalify and perhaps achieve new things and then still have a hunger and 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 live life then you know it, it, i think it's proof that you know there's hope for many other people out there it, it goes back to what i said earlier you just have to really want it and you have to stay hungry we all do if we stay hungry we can we can achieve remarkable things i mean i know that you're you know you're you're doing some great things and you you got a few years on me and you're in the pool and you're still smashing it out and you're sort of setting yourself these these extreme sort of challenges and i, I think that's commendable yeah i i, I it's 50-50 with me though Jamie. like i'm not just doing it for me i'm i'm doing it as as an example, because yeah. I, I I don't want to get into too deep a conversation, but I just feel we've massively been lied to as a as a as a species. And when I see people, I mean, to just take your situation. How is it that we can become so upset and depressed at say right, losing a um, a car valeting business, just a silly example, right? But society's condition has hidden the beauty in life from us that much that we consider something so material a materialistic operation such as that is worth taking your own life for. And then we hear your story and it's like, it's a, if we could get your story and give it to that guy or that girl when they're, they're standing on that precipice or they're about to, you know, hang themselves in a garage and say, dude, come on, look, 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 you, you can start again. You know, you, 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 you haven't been through this massive cat. Uh, I don't want to say catastrophic isn't the right word, but this massive life changing experience and bloody hell, if there's ever a, a uh, uh, lesson for looking at the bloody bright side of life. You epitomise it, Jamie. You know. Well, well, I try to. I mean, um, you know, like I said, I try to be that glass half full guy. You know, albeit, you know, I've got sort of a bit of scarred vision, sort of dodgy hearing from that explosion that I described, and sort of a few battle scars, a few sort of uh, outward facial scars, to say the least. But you know, you know, um, there's always a life worth living. In, in, in my in my uh, humble opinion and um you know I, I understand i mean listen people's ordeals we don't know what's going on in another person's mind and everybody has their own sort of tolerance to 
um, to challenge and to difficulty. And when your, your glass, you know, you may, may be able to tolerate a whole lot in your life before your glass sort of spills over with the stress level. Yeah. For other people, you know, their, their spillover point is, you know, they've got a much smaller sort of vessel and it spills over. Um, and you know, it's just one of those things. Um, and, and who are we to judge really what goes on in another man's mind? If he, if he or she reaches the lowest ebb and they, they, they kind of stoop so low, um, you know, they're kind of considering sort of, you know, the ultimate act to sort of end it. Um, I mean, God knows I was there. So I truly understand that. I really do. But, but also on the flip side, I firmly believe that, um, if you learn to, you know, see the brighter side of life, and if you learn to look at, um, that what life can offer you, um, even though it might take a little bit of, you know, external focus, you know, thinking outside the box, uh, in order to, 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 re- to redefine yourself, in order to reframe the new narrative for yourself as an individual. But you can absolutely go on and achieve, you know, new things. You can, you can, you can switch. You can, you can almost, you know, if the wind's blowing, you know, from the north and you were once kind of tacking and take adv- taking advantage of that, well, you know, figuratively speaking, if the wind starts blowing from the, you know, from the northeast, you can you can start to work with that, you know, and and, and sail a different path and, and yeah, tack a good. new a new um, a new tra- a new a new track in life. Again, you just need to know, or, or you need to, you need to know where the opportunities are coming from, and perhaps um, you know to to capitalize on and, and, and monopolize on on where the opportunities are and and think a little bit outside the box and stay hungry above all i know i've said that again and again but if you you know keep the old pecker up because life can always get better it really can you know you 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 know remember those rainy days you know really dismal dark sort of rainy days that that prevail every now and again well you know before you know it you know, they might last a few days at worst, but then guess what? You know, the heavens will kind of open and, and that the sort of the clouds will part and there'll be blue skies once again. And you can, and you, you can live that sort of new version of yourself and the new life. That, that's what it's all about. You know, just, just hold on, you know, work with it, work with yourself and, and hold on and want it and you will get there. Yes, it's, We've always got to bear in mind we're a product of our thoughts and our thoughts are temporary. That's all they are. They can seem really like bad at the time and but but they are temporary. They won't last. Think think you know, change is inevitable and uh yes, so hang in there, folks. For for anyone who might be struggling, if you look below. Um, Luke, my manager, and I, we put together a, a, a list of um, support agencies. There's one link at the bottom of this YouTube video. And if you click on that link, it will take you to a separate website where we've listed as many um, avenues of support. Well, we've, we've listed about 10 to cover both civilian and, uh, uh, civilian and military. Jamie, wow. Um, Two hours doesn't cover it. You know, well, we we've been chatting for nearly three hours. Three hours um, now. First of all, come back on the podcast and and let's just chat again because we, I think we we haven't talked. There's so so much more. I think that we can probably explore. yeah. And also, it would just be great to chat to you about, you know, about things like triathlon, about stuff that's not so, <laughs> not so deep. Um, obviously, for this first one, we had to, we had to go into into that area. But um, I think we could probably do a part two, and I can tell you about my triathlon story, but it wasn't so successful. But I can tell you about what I still got out of it even though I sort of failed miserably, but that might interest some of your hey, listeners. I love failure and, and <laughs> I, I'm cause I'm an old man and I don't care about anything. 
except my family. I, it, it, I, I love fate. I love, I love coming last in triathlon as much. It means as much to me coming laugh and, and chuckling as it probably does to the guy who comes first. Um, so I got nothing to prove, mate. I was abysmal at the weekend. <laughs> it, it's the, trying the, and participating that counts, mate, at our age. So yeah, that see at the weekend, it may as well have been um, glue. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> I think glue would have been faster. I could have maybe pulled my way through it a bit quicker. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, we get one life, mate, don't we? And that's you it. Know, we, we have to roll with the punches, and 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 I think your analogy of the yachting yeah. is good, and the, and then keep surging forth. As the great Muhammad Ali once said, "Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee." Yes. <laughs> Jamie, look after yourself. Stay on the line so I can thank you properly when I hit the record button off. But um, yes. W- what a story, but moreover, what a guy. So thank you ever so much. Hey, to thank ev- you, Chris. Oh, you're welcome. You are very welcome. To everybody at home, much love to you all. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. If you could please like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And see you soon.